Hello and welcome to Geeky Cool and my name is Mandy and I am here with author S.A. Bird who is debuting her second book which will be coming out on Friday, um, October 13th, uh, 2023. Um, so, but before we get into that, um, I want to talk about geekycool.com for just a quick bit. Um, our website is geekycool with a K dot com, uh, where we have all kinds of articles written from all different perspectives. One of them is just happens to be my oldest child who likes to write also. So he is a young aspiring journalist. Um, also we, um, have something for a little bit of every, uh, a little bit of something for everybody. Um, we're also, you can find us on Facebook, um, and also on YouTube where we upload regularly. So be sure to check us out and, um, all that fun stuff. Anyway, uh, without much further ado, let's talk about, um, Miss Samantha Bird. How are you today? I'm well, how are you? Good. So this is your first book, The Three Ring Scavenger, and it came out this last February, correct? Correct. February 13th. All right. Tell us a little bit about the writing process. Um, so the writing process for this book was very much a ADHD, hyperfixation, fever dream mesh up. So I had started off cosplaying as um, Maud, who is the female main character in this book, and I just realized that Maud needed her very own backstory to everything that she is. Right. So this book follows her as a human as she is turned immortal into, um, as you can tell, a, a scavenger, which is my own creation. Right. Um, she was widowed at in her mid thirties, and this book takes place in like the late 1800s so being in your 30s and widowed then was pretty much a death sentence right and she had was still running a tavern and a house of ill repute if you will um and then she's confronted by a vampire named owen and his Mm -hmm. lover a demon named balam and they offer her immortality if she goes with them to join a circus that is ran by a deity. All right. That's exciting. So this is the setting is the late 1800s and in the, is that like in, in America? Um, Yeah. It's in New Orleans, New Orleans. Okay. So um, what, Oh, um, before we get too much further, I forgot to mention, um, so for um, our viewers uh, that may not be aware, uh, The Three Ring Scavenger um, and also its sequel, Scavenger on the Run, is considered a dark romance genre. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, dark romance and what readers should expect? So for any reader that's new to the term dark romance, a couple key words, romance is kind of like the segue for saying there's going to be adult content in the book. Um, Usually of the you need to be 18 and over content. Right. Um, Dark usually means there's topics that just normally aren't spoken about in normal polite company. And most dark romance books, there'll be a page in the front. Mine are no exception. And it lists the trigger warnings. So for my books, for example, trigger warnings would be blasphemy because it does give my own take on gods and lack thereof, Um, conspiracy, human consumption is a big one. That's something you don't normally think about when you think of romance, right? Blood, gore, murder, Mm -hmm. consent, non-consent. So if you ever hear someone say, hey, this is a dark romance, but I think you should read it, read the warnings, read the trigger warnings, because your mental health is worth way more than any story. Always, always, always check your um, trigger warnings. And if you're not sure about them, always feel free to ask 
someone that has read the book or even reach out to the author be like, hey, does it depict blah? Right, exactly. Um, I think the difference for me, what comes to mind would be something that would be featured on HBO versus something that would be featured on ABC or CBS. Um, sure. So like, you, you know, most people understand that if it's on HBO, the the maturity rating is like off the roof or, you know, like through the roof. Sorry. <laughs> um, right. So so the books that you've written do have some content for uh, that might not be suitable for all viewers, but for those that are interested in dark romance, I think these would be um, a good um, a good read, I believe. So um, so we talked about um, a little bit about your um, the trigger warnings. We talked a little bit about who Maud was. Um, can you? give us a little bit about the setting. Like I know you talked about it being set in Louisiana um, in around um, the late 1800s. Um, can you give us a little bit more about that? So it is in New Orleans, in, New or uh, in Louisiana. So right there in the heart of the French Quarter, it's, you always want to have a steady flow of people for the kind of business that sells alcohol and women. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I liked most about that time is my book has a lot of New Orleans Easter eggs in it. Like it references the casket girls because that has come to pass. Mm -hmm. New Orleans has its own spooky lore. So while my work is fully fiction, it was kind of fun to bring in those natural spooky New Orleans vibes to a book. Right. Absolutely. So um, anybody that might be familiar with um, Anne Rice's interview with the vampire series, you know, they do spend a lot of time in New Orleans. And um, I like, I think that's what I really like about the books that you've written are all the little uh, pieces and parts. Um, like I know in the second book, you talk about um, the swamps and the trees and, you know, like the, I mean, you know, I could almost see the Spanish moss hanging from the trees. I, as a, when I was young, I grew up in Florida um, for a few years or not, didn't grow up, grow up, but I spent several years of my childhood in, in Florida. So um, adjacent to New Orleans and, or Louisiana in, in, in itself. And, you know, like, it's just a different atmosphere um, if you're not, if you've never been to that area. So um, I think you do a really good job of, of setting um, that uh, scene for everybody. Um, so tell us a little bit, you, you mentioned, uh, the scavenger. What is a scavenger? And this was a, a thing that you have created yourself. What was your inspiration yeah. with that too? So one day I was lost in my own little ADHD brain and I realized one thing I've noticed about almost all vampire movies or books or whatever if some creatures there just drinking the blood, like a vampire drinks the blood, a demon will eat a soul, there should just be corpses piling about. Like they right. just never addressed that. So a right. scavenger was my way of addressing Maud's job once she becomes a scavenger is to eat the human remains left by the other depraved creatures of the circus. Mm -hmm. And then you kind you of do keep your trail clean. Right. You do get into a little bit of detail with that, um, um, especially in the first book for for um, anybody that's not been initiated with the concept of human consumption. <laughs> there it is. It's like, wow, that she really goes all in. Um, but that is a it's an integral part of Maud. And it's not that she necessarily um, enjoys being that, but it is something that she does do, I think, um, as a person who is keeping to her end of the bargain, um, that she makes. So one of the characters that plays a huge part of the story and the plot, um, and also as an antagonist is the character Muse. So tell me, who he is, how'd you come up with him, 
and all of those things? So Muse is definitely a meshup of, I have my little visual down here. One of the characters that helped inspire Muse is the governor from my friend Danny's comic book, Carlsworth's Clockwork Circus, because if you read the book, you know, Muse is the ringmaster with the mask and... Mm -hmm. And what what was the name of the the comic book author? Oh, um, Danny Oliver is the author. Okay, so. that's very cool. I just didn't if somebody might oh. be interested. So that's yeah, really it, cool. Uh, it's a steampunk circus. The governor is nothing like Muse though. This was just right. like the inspiration for Muse's aesthetics. Okay, so right. don't don't confuse my dark romance with this with this punk. one. <laughs> <laughs> They are not the same. Right. Um, but it's kind of a mix up of him, um, the greatest showman, the Phantom of the Opera, and Jared, the Goblin King from the Labyrinth. Like, it's just all of these big, loud beings just into one. Right. And it Muse in the book goes by, he, he is a deity, he is an ethereal deity. Mm -hmm. And he goes by the several names. One would be Serendipity. Um, favorite. God, not, not his favorite. That's what Dionysus calls him. And he does not, not appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, his brother thought that he should go by the name Loki because he is the god of mischief and trickery and illusions. Mm -hmm. But while he's hiding from the other gods, he came up with his own name. Um, he decided he wanted to become Muse because he has inspiration over humans. Right. Very much so. And this character also um, seems to have a lot of animosity toward the other um, pantheon of gods um, in your story. And so he likes to cause trouble, I think. Um, where, however, and wherever he can, and um, so Maud kind of gets swept up in that and has to deal, you know, make some decisions based on some of those issues. <laughs> a lot of those issues. <laughs> a lot of those issues. So um, you wrote the Three Ring Scavenger, and then I was really surprised to find out that you came up with or you had written and are getting ready to publish the second book within the same year. So that's actually a very fast turnaround for a lot of people. Um, can you, uh, oh, let me turn that part off. Sorry. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about book two, Scavenger on the Run. So book two is definitely a part two in what is going to be a trilogy. This is a continuation from the first story. So if you haven't read the first book, second book's not going to make sense. Right. It just jumps forward 20 years. So it's the middle of Prohibition. She's actually, this book starts off with her in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And she finds herself 20 years later, immortal, but doing the same thing. She's running a tavern, an illegal speakeasy. She has women of ill repute in her um, employment. And she's once again surrounded by mafia men, which in the first book is kind of one of the things of her existence. Right. Um, there's always so some dude out there. Somewhere. <laughs> always, always somebody out there. Um, but she thought, if, in this book, she thinks that she's done running from news and her past and what she'd done to him mm -hmm. and then the goddess of death anubis finds their way to Maud, and they give Maud a a quest essentially Maud knows it's a trap but the goddess sends Maud back to new orleans back to the circus mm -hmm. and she runs into all kinds of problems there too and all kinds of problems I do like that in the second book, she has, she kind of comes into her powers a little bit more. She understands, or she starts learning a little bit more about what she's able to do. Um, and I'm not going to spoil it for anybody, but I just, I really like that, um, you know, in the first one, she, she kind of 
comes into her own and makes certain decisions. But then in her, in the second book, she's still learning about herself um, and, and all the things that she is able to do and not necessarily takes advantage of it, but she uses it for the betterment of herself and those that she cares about. So, um, and it's, it's a very powerful story, I think. Um, and then I found that she's weighing what she wants versus, you know, like the, the, the weight between the heart and the mind, you know, what is it that she wants versus, um, what would be good for everybody, you know, and what she needs too, you know, she can't live without certain situations. So she has a hard, hard decision to make. Um, and I know a lot of your ARC readers <laughs> have been giving you some, some trouble about, and, and for those that aren't familiar with the term, an ARC reader, ARC stands for advanced reader copy. So those that have read the book ahead of time before the release date and given um, the author some feedback. Um, so you've, you've gotten a little, little bit of uh, guff for that, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they got teeth. They bite. <laughs> a, a little bit. <laughs> but no, it was, it's still very humbling to know that I wrote something mm -hmm. and they felt the same thing I felt. Good. Because that's kind of maybe one of those imposter syndrome things where you're like, oh, I, I wrote this, but is it going to come across the way that I want it to come across? Right. And it did. Mm -hmm. It did. This one definitely hit home with a little too close to home for some of my art readers. Well, there's something validating in having um, readers. And and I know we'd talked about that before, that um, when you, because um, not, not all indie authors find uh, success, um, but you have had, you've been blessed with some great uh, followers and great readers, um, people that have given you feedback and that, that thrill of having um, somebody that's not your friends or family um, purchase your book and be able to, you know, give you that information. Um, do you, you do, would you like to talk about that a little bit or is there anything? Um... No, it's, it is definitely, again, humbling and just amazing when the, cause the first person to buy my book and write a review was my mom. Thanks, Linda. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is still when this person that you've never heard of, never met, they seen my book on TikTok. They took the time to purchase it, to read it, to write a review. And then it's just, okay, m maybe I'm, I'm not a fraud. Maybe I do have something to mm -hmm. my writing. Absolutely. You know, and I know imposter something, uh, imposter syndrome, I'm sorry, is something that a lot of um, authors uh, have to deal with, whether they're writing their first book or whether they're writing their 20th. I think it's still something that most creatives have to have to struggle with. Um, do you have any tips um, or advice for first time authors? Um, the best piece of advice I've ever heard for a first-time author is you can edit anything except a blank page. And that made the world like, okay, let me write this. Even if this doesn't quite make sense the first time around, mm -hmm. I can go back and edit it. But just kind of word dumping at first. And that's okay. Your rough draft is not going to be what almost anybody else sees your, even your editor is not going to see your first rough draft. Right. So, and, and rough uh, first drafts are supposed to be um, rough. I mean, that's why rough. they called that to begin with. <laughs> I mean, and, and any editor uh, with their salt should be aware of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think if authors knew um, that finding the right editor, you know, and just finding somebody that, um, is not going to be not going to, you know, rip them apart and make them feel awful. Right. Um, you know, that's, it, it's okay, you know, and, 
Um, I know feedback is scary. Um, it's hard to get over. Feedback uh, is very scary. Yes, that's yeah. the worst part. Like, <laughs> I'm fairly good at taking constructive criticism, and but it's hard to find the person that can give you the constructive criticism without you feeling attacked. Right. Because especially your first, like that's my baby. Yeah. Like you wouldn't call my baby ugly, would you, to mama's face? But that's what you're asking people to do is tell you how ugly your baby is. It's so like, why do I walk like that? It, <laughs> right. So when the next person sees it, you know, your baby's not so ugly. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and you know, and that's, you know, a lot of creatives, I think, have to go through that. Um, that it's because you're, there's a vulnerability, you know, being able to put, expose yes. yourself and put yourself out there. And I totally understand why, why um, a lot of authors use a, a pen name or, you know, um, to, to, you know, kind of avoid, um, oh, I don't know, like, I'm like, that wasn't me. <laughs> Right. So. Yeah, unfortunately, I was born without shame. It's a birth defect. I just don't care. That's not a birth. That is a strength. <laughs> like being able to no say exactly what you want to say. You know, I I have a lot of uh, admiration for people that um, not necessarily that they have no filter, but they have they don't care like it. Like, you're not going to ruffle my feathers. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think, you know? <laughs> I think that's a, that's a strength. That's, sorry, I'm yeah. shaking around up here. <sighs> All right. Well, um, so for our viewers, let me back up a little bit. Um, I wish I could show these side by side. I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, the Three Ring Scavenger is already out um, and available. Oh, and show us the show us the paper, oh. like the the edges here. Let me. Oh, I gotta find where my camera is. Make it a little closer. Okay, so here's. Yeah, okay, let's start with the first book. There, sorry, Three Ring yeah. Scavenger, and then it has the literally on the edges, mm -hmm. which is printed into the book. So anybody that buys a printed version will get the the pretty book. I think that is just so cool. design because. I love New Orleans. Both books, because they go back to New Orleans again. We have the St. Louis Cathedral, and then there's my cathedral again. Yeah, that is so cool. And can you um, tell us? Uh, can you can you tell us who who did your edges like that? Um, Painted Wings Publishing. Okay. And I can send you their info if you want, Mandy. It's she's amazing. She started that as a side gig, and now I think it's her gig gig. Yeah. They're I mean, off. They're awesome. That's so neat. I mean, I I had never seen anything um, like that before, where it's in the print. I mean, you see you see mm -hmm. people that physically like do this pretty sprayed edges, and I mean, and I but know by the time I paid for sprayed edges, I paid for that, and now anybody is guaranteed to get that beautiful print. And it's not like a special exclusive. Everybody deserves a pretty book. Yeah, exactly. It's unique. It's something that, and you, I don't know, that's just really cool. All right. Um, where can um, readers find, oh, we were, we were talking about, I'm sorry, got kind of off that's track. Fine. <laughs> you know me. All right. So the second book, Scavenger on the Run. Let me hide this so you can see the whole thing. Um, that is available coming up um, and it hits the stores so to speak <laughs> it's Amazon it's the Zon yeah the Zon um, it's on Amazon and Kindle on Friday the 13th October 2023 so if you but you need to read the first one before you read the second one so you need to read the first one first you check that out um, and where can uh, where can readers follow you for to stay updated and learn about the third book that's already being written as we speak. I'm working on it. I promise I'm working on it. <laughs> um, my Instagram is s.a.bird. And then on the Tiki Talkies, I am sabird2. 
2.0 because mm-hmm. I got banana on my first account. <laughs> yes, the the old uh, Tiki Talk. Um, the Tiki Talk bananaed me. Yeah, there was something. I don't know. You were just too spicy, I guess. I, I don't know, know exactly what happened, but I'm not going to say because I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah, oh, well, it wasn't me. I promise. <laughs> No, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope everybody checks you out um, or checks out your books, so to speak, Um, buys your books Um, and buy two, one to read and one to keep pretty on the shelf or to give away for a friend. Or to give away. Yeah. Yeah. And if they follow. If you you love my book, keep it. If you don't, give it to your mother-in-law. (laughs) Yes. So she can be like, oh, my. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, if somebody wants to um, get into a drawing for a giveaway um, and they have to like. So on TikTok, you have to say it just right. You have to say shmiv away. Otherwise, the 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 banana hammer might come down. Um, Oh, you even have a beautiful black cat. This is Snowball. I love it. Help yourself. Yeah, okay. She's like, this is this is where all the action's happening. <laughs> so if people follow you on, on TikTok, they might have a chance to Yes, if they might have a snowball. So they might have a snowball chance. Um I'm having I'm definitely regardless of how many people end up following me, I'm gonna give away four sets of book one and two. Mm-hmm. So eight books, four sets to four different people, signed copy, papered back copies. And if I'm able to get back up to a thousand um, viewers on TikTok subscribers, so that's the magic number so you can go live. Mm-hmm. And then if I can go live, I'll have a live book drop party where I'll give away one big PR box that will have hard copies and some merch and just some other little goodies that I've been holding for this big PR box that that's hopefully I can give away. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, and, but that's also time sensitive. So if you're interested in that, be sure to, uh, follow, uh, author S.A. Bird. <laughs> I have to make sure I'm like, I can't call you well, by your, your nickname. Name, yeah. <laughs> the nickname you that nobody can tell, say, uh, call you except for me. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but anyway, um. All right, so follow Ms. Bird, Mrs. Hey. Bird, um, and um, I guess we will see you guys next time, um, and be sure to follow us also on geekycool.com, you know, like the actual website. We also have Facebook and YouTube, like I've already said, but anyway, thank you so much for being with us, and I'll see you later. Bye. See ya. Bye.